Now let me introduce the speaker. Jennifer uh, has her background in environmental conservation and works for fish welfare initiate, initiative as a research and project strategist. Fish Welfare Initiative was found last year with the goal of improving the lives of fish on fish farms. Jennifer is responsible for finding high impact opportunities and driving forward to the organization's strategy. This presentation is going to give us an update about the current state of the movement for fishes. So here comes Jennifer's talk, Fish Advocacy Movement, current state, recent developments, and future prospects. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, Monica, and thank you for putting together this presentation. We've been enjoying it so far. Um, let me share my slides with you. And thank you um, for all of you joining and for being interested to learn more about the fish advocacy movement. Um, like Monica pointed out, I'm with Fish Welfare Initiative, and our ultimate goal is to improve the lives of fishes and we're starting by doing so um, by focusing on farmed fish. Um, so this presentation is focusing a little more on that aspect. Um, but if you want to talk about fisheries, please feel free to do so during the questions um, at the end of the talk. So before we get started, I would like to just take a look back at some of the past successes within the movement. Um, and if you remember or I mean, unfortunately, there's still a reality. Um, gestation crates are pretty horrible for pigs. And who would have thought that one of the major industry newspapers in Canada, the Western producer, actually took a stance against gestation crates very recently. And to put it into simple words, um, you'd be a fairly dumb person if you install gestation crates on your farm right now. And we have seen more successes like this, right? So there's the better chicken commitment, um, which leads to a lot of chickens just leading not optimal lives, but a lot better lives um, than they used to live. And as such, the movement really has come a long way and we have frequently expanded our moral circle, but we also still have a long way to go. And therefore like the next movement, uh, the next frontier, sorry, of this movement really are fish. And the scale of this um, is really massive. Um, so there are 111 billion fish alive on farms at any given point. And I put together this illustration just because I have a very hard time wrapping my head around these numbers. Um, and so fish, um, the blue guys here, the light blue guys, and then you have chickens, the dark blue. And so you have four times as many fish as you have chickens um, alive at any given point. And if you compare that to humans, um, it's about 14 times as many fish as there are humans um, alive at this very point. And that's just like staggering numbers. And unfortunately, the conditions um, for those fish are not very good. And if we're looking at this graph right here, um, this is a trend that's going to continue. So you can see the blue line here and fish um, from agriculture, which means fish farms, is already um, the majority of the fish consumed by humans. And this is expected to grow at an annual growth rate of 2.5%. And that means that there's going to be 2.6 billion more fish on farms per year. So in this um, talk, I'm going to talk first about fish farms and what are conditions actually like, like what do fish farms look like, um, what are some problems on those farms, and also what are some opportunities where we can uh, merge in as animal advocates. I'll then go on about talking about the movement. So what are organizations and people working on? You heard some talks earlier today, and I will try to get back to them too. Um, and also um, some bottlenecks that they experience. Um, so what do people think hinders effective work for fish? We'll then move to public attitudes. So what do society actually, what do they think about fish? And then I will also talk about messaging because what is an effective strategy in one country may very well be not working at all in a different country. And finally, I just want to summarize a few possible way forwards and I will tailor them very specifically to areas of expertise. So I hope they can be helpful for everyone listening to this. So we'll start out with fish farms. 
And basically there are four major types of aquaculture farms. And that's just a very fancy word for fish farms. And there's ponds, so they can be artificial or they can be natural. And I'm sure you've all seen them um, at some point just out in the wild. So you can farm fish in there. Um, there are also raceways. There are basically basins that get water from one side and then discharge the water on the other side. So that basically creates a constant flow of water as opposed to the pond system. And then you have recirculatory aquaculture systems, which you can see in the third picture here. And they're a highly intensive system. So you have a closed tank and you have water and a filter. And that filter is basically renewing the water the whole time and filtering it. And then you have sea cages on the right hand side here, which are basically what the name says. They're cages attached to those little buoys. You can see them in the picture here in blue. Um, so that holds them up and they can be either in the ocean or in the lake. And the fish are basically enclosed in those cages, but in the natural water body. So we um, visited several fish farms across Europe and Asia, and I would like to take you through a little tour. Um, and we, when we visited those fish farms, we actually told the farmers that we're an animal welfare NGO, we're interested in improving the health and the well-being of fish. And the farmers were really open about letting us on their farms. And we do encourage other organizations or also individuals to just visit a few of those farms because we still have a very bad idea about what conditions are actually like in most of the countries, especially in um, the North American countries, well, South American, we have a better idea in Europe, but also pretty bad idea in Africa and Asia. So we'll get started with Norway and um, a Norwegian salmon farm that we visited is the perfect example of an intensive um, fish farming system. So you can see the Atlantic salmon right up here and you can see the sea cage in which they're farmed on um, the right side of the screen. And the problem with this is that salmon are a highly migratory species. Um, so usually in the wild, they would migrate thousands of miles up the coast until they end up in the river and then they go upstream against the current of the river where they then lay their eggs, they die and their offspring makes the same journey backwards. And obviously this natural instinct of migration is totally suppressed in captivity. And that's not just an issue of Norway, that's an issue for any migratory species that you keep in sea cages like this. And another big problem that was already pointed out yesterday in the talk about law enforcement and law opportunities is sea lice. So those are the little parasites you can see on the bottom left here. And they basically attach to the scale of the fish and they literally eat them alive. So they eat off the scale, they're exposing flesh and they're eating so much off in some cases that you can literally see the skull of the fish and the bone, um, which is obviously extremely painful for the fish and unfortunately very prevalent in farming systems just because you're keeping so many fish in such a close space. Um, next, we also visited a farm in Germany and this raceway system here on the left side is a really good example of a semi-intensive system. So semi-intensive means that the farmer controls some parameters, but they also let the fish be. They're basically just in those ponds, they add some um, feed and they also control the water quality usually or test it at least. Um, a problem that we observed there were injuries, as you can see on the right hand side here. For this one, it's hard to tell whether this is an actual injury or a bacterial infection, but bacterial infections are big problems on farms because if you have, for example, a change in water temperature, the fish get infected very easily and that leads to those open wounds which obviously get infected by the water and it's just like a vicious cycle. Um, also aggression between those fish is a problem on farms worldwide if they're kept in such tight spaces, especially when they're usually more solitary species or species that would just not naturally occur in such dense numbers. Next, we are going to Asia. So we visited farms in Vietnam and India, and the picture you can see here was a backyard pond farm in Vietnam. And this is a perfect example of a lot of farms over there. They're usually very small scale. They're in people's backyards. 
They're sometimes just for the people themselves or maybe for some neighbors, they're selling off to local markets, but it's definitely not big of a business as it would be for some of the bigger farms, like for example, the one in Norway we visited. Um, and the fish here, they're usually just put in the pond in their lab B. So um, they don't add any feed. Um, they don't control the water quality. The fish cheese eat off the algae and the phyto and zooplankton in the pond. And this holds well for issues because sometimes the pond water just gets bad, but no one realizes. And then the fish really suffer under inadequate um, conditions. And on the right hand side, this is something we observed in Vietnam fish were being transported to a slaughter facility and they were transported in these blue buckets, um, being left in those buckets without water for up to 20 minutes as they were waiting to move to the slaughter facility. And as you can imagine, those fish out of the water and just being stacked upon each other holds some serious concern about um, how bad that experience is for them. And this is something um, with the backyard ponds that we also observed in India. And another thing we saw in India, which we found interesting and scary, was them actually farming fish in sewage water, which, as you can imagine, in terms of water quality, is not very promising and, in fact, does lead to infections and diseases quite frequently. And maybe concerning our conversation with farmers, we actually found them interested in improving the conditions. So if you point out some positive aspects of those improvements for the farmer, they're quite open to working with foreign NGOs. And I think that's a promising thing to keep in mind um, when considering to work on fish. Another farm, um, this is Egypt. This is not a farm we visited, but um, someone we talked to from the University of Stirling. Um, he's doing research on fish welfare specifically tilapia welfare and he visited a farm in Egypt and on the right hand side you can see a recirculatory aquaculture system and this is the perfect example of another very highly intensive system um, of fish farming so you have this pump here and you have water and the water basically gets filtered so it's a highly controlled system usually very prevalent in North American and European countries not so much in African countries um, but this one was installed by an international NGO, uh, Worldfish, and basically is one of the first of its kind in Egypt. The left picture um, shows a very sad reality of fish before slaughter. So usually what is done is they're being crowded together very close because it makes it a lot easier to either pump them out through a pipe or to just get them out with a huge net. Um, and as you can imagine, if those fish are just stacked upon each other like that, water quality gets an issue, them being aggressive to each other gets an issue, and just, yeah, being perched together is not an optimal condition for those fish to be in. And um, this is not a problem of Egypt. This is a practice that's frequently done both in ponds and sea cages across the world. So, and we went, we went to India, we actually did a little survey. Um, it was really a baby survey compared to how many farms there are in India, but we asked seven farmers about what they think the biggest challenges are when farming fish. And for them, environmental conditions and diseases and parasites are the major issues. Um, they saw slaughter less as an issue, but that is very well also because slaughter happens outside of their facility usually so they bring the fish away and they don't have anything to do with slaughter. Um, interestingly enough they think environmental conditions are a bigger issue um, and environmental conditions for example include water quality but we then asked them well how often do you check water quality and um, some of them the one the best thing we got was every second day which as you can imagine water can get bad pretty quickly. So every second day is definitely not enough. But more scaringly, someone actually said 25% of the people said they're never checking water quality ever. And another 25% said they're checking water quality, but only when a problem arises. And when a problem arises on fish farms actually means when the fish are dead on the surface, some of them. Um, and that's definitely too late. So now moving away from that general introduction about farming systems, we're going to talk a little bit more about the movement. Um, so earlier this year, we actually conducted a survey. We reached out to 52 um, animal advocacy organizations across the world. 
Um, though there is probably a sample bias because our work is focused on Asia and we're um, both working with groups from Europe and from North America. So we probably subconsciously reached out to more of those groups as opposed to, for example, some African groups. But we did have some interesting findings. So 36 of the 52 organizations we asked either already work on fish or consider working on fish. So that's really promising news. Um, fish are definitely on the agenda of most of these organizations. And if they're not yet, they're at least, you know, thinking about what they can do. And for each continent, there were at least 20% of the organizations that are interested to work on there, except of Antarctica. And Europe seems to be getting the most attention. So there were 69% of organizations working there and Oceania gets the least with 21% of organizations working there, which is still a pretty good number though. Um, and those numbers are not absolute though, because um, respondents could actually pick several um, continents. So they're not absolute numbers, but they give an idea about where they generally work or want to work in the future. And it got more interesting when we asked them to specify countries. And here you can see either our sample bias, because weirdly enough, that's like the US, Europe and Asia that um, they pointed out the countries there. But also this might suggest that the more like most work that's already done is actually done in North America and Europe. And there is some work or work considerations in Asia too. Again, here they could also name several countries. So these are by no means um, absolute numbers. And these are by no means highly representative numbers because like I said, we only have 52 organizations and there's way more advocacy organizations out there. And next we asked them, what do you actually work on? Like when you're advocating for fish and or when you consider advocate for fish, what do you work on? And raising awareness was one of the biggest ones. Um, again, they could pick several answers here. Um, another one was research and also policies. Corporate outreach to a little lesser extent. And my guess here would be that we just don't have a very good ask yet um, to ask corporations what we want them to do, just because fish, it's very complex. There's many different species and we're still kind of trying to move into this, trying to find out what we can ask for corporations. And as you can see, certification is kind of the least amount which also has to do with the fact that there is already a certification out there. So it just makes sense to just urge them to include welfare instead of developing a new one. And also developing a certification scheme really requires expertise in that particular field and industry knowledge. Um, we then went on and asked what actually hinders work. And this is interesting because this gets at what is hindering effective work on fish within our movement, which is something we should be highly aware of. And all the things we mentioned, um, the organization thought they were almost equally important. So there seems to be a lack of scientific research. There seems to be a lack of funding. There seems to be a lack of public support. Some of the organizations we talked to, they're just currently focused on other issues. So a lot of them are like um, just wrapping up the chicken stuff right now, and then they want to move on to fish. Um, and then, like I pointed out earlier, it is just sometimes hard to get corporations or producers to commit. And part of that could be that we're just still working on a common ask right now. So it will be a lot easier once we have that common ask to reach out as a unit and be like, okay, this is what we want and this is what you should be doing. And there is an interesting part about the bottlenecks here. Um, we separated it by organizations that already work on fish and the ones that not yet work on fish. And there is a different um, perceived importance here. So organizations that already work on fish, they see funding um, as a more like it's a problem with 35%, right? But it's not like a huge problem. Whereas organizations that not yet work on fish, they do think that funding could be a major issue um, once they actually start working on fish. So that's interesting. And on the other hand, lack of public support, um, organizations that not yet work on fish seem to be fairly confident that there is enough public support. But once organizations actually start working on fish issues, they realize that there's maybe not enough public support and that is actually hindering effective work for them. 
And this is something important to keep in mind because this tells us that there seems to be a big difference between what organizations think the state of the art is in the movement and what the state of the art really is. All right, so now we're moving toward public attitudes and society and what their opinions are and how we can leverage that. So um, there was a study done by Solius from Rethink Priorities. I put the link down here. And he basically looked at different surveys from Europeans and how they perceive fish, what they think about fish. And um, they actually care, like at least the surveys say they care. Um, so they may care about fish welfare uh, to a similar extent as they care about chicken and pig welfare. And that's pretty promising. And to me, at least, was counterintuitive to my feeling about just people not caring about fish a whole lot. Um, unfortunately, there's a, some research on this for Europe, but there's very little for other continents. So we're currently writing up a blog post about this particular thing in Asia. So what are public attitudes there? but we haven't really come to a conclusion yet. Um, but it does seem that there is at least some support. And a common theme I heard from talking to industry people was, well, we don't work on welfare because people just don't care. And I think that's a problem, right? And that's either a problem because people actually don't care, which doesn't seem to be the case, or it's a problem that we don't communicate it well to industry that people actually care. So very good step could be to make industry aware that there is public support for fishes, either through campaigns or through doing more surveys, actually asking people, do you care about fish? And then relaying that information further. Yeah, and this actually leads to another really important part. Um, and that's the point that what works really well in, for example, Germany, may just not work in China, just because it's a completely different culture, it's a completely different continent, a different country, and things just work differently there. So we've actually found that going to India, talking to farmers about ethical reasons to improve welfare, just wasn't very successful. But once we started talking about public health and um, safety concerns, like food safety concerns, they actually started listening more. And I think this is something we should keep in mind moving forward that there is several areas um, that fish welfare interacts with that we can leverage to make people care. And we researched a little bit into this and we actually found six major areas. Um, so fish welfare affects public health. It also affects food safety, environmental protection. It can actually provide cleaner water waste. It can be a mean of disease control and business resilience. And this is like, we put a lot of research into this and this is a really broad topic, but to give you one example, when fish are stressed, they actually start eating less. Um, and they're also, their immune system is weakened. So overall, they're just more susceptible to diseases. They get parasites easier. And in the end, there's also gonna be a higher mortality rate because of that. Now, if you improve welfare, you can actually increase, sorry, decrease disease rates and you can decrease mortality rates. And this is important, right? Because in Chile, for example, there's an organization working on reducing antibiotic use. And the only way they can do that is by increasing welfare. There's just not really any other way you can reduce the disease rate. And this is something that can be used to make people actually care. So we try to put a website together to just make it easily accessible to anyone who wants to learn more about this. And this just summarizes all the different areas that fish welfare affects. Um, so feel free to check it out and use that information in designing your campaigns or designing your advocacy work and really tailoring it to the desires and the needs of the people that you're talking to. Because fish welfare, sure, we care about the ethics of it, but other people may just care more about public health or about environmental things than about ethics. All right, and now we're moving on to advocating for fish. And I wanna talk a little bit about the way forward. So fish, like I said, are still a really new frontier and we just don't have a very good idea of what works best and what doesn't. So we haven't really tried a lot of interventions. We don't know which approaches work best like we do for other animals. So we should experiment and we really should 
take the time to try different things. If they don't work, well, that sucks. Then just tell the movement, let them know and be like, don't try this again. This worked really horribly. But on the other hand, like we heard earlier today with the campaigns on ban of live sailfish, if stuff works, um, also tell the movement, be like, hey, this was really successful. Maybe we should export this to other countries. Could this be something that also works in, for example, Poland? Um, it worked in Lithuania. Maybe, you know, you guys should try that too. Um, and that's something really important that we should keep in mind that we're still very young in working for fish. So we just need to experiment with different approaches. And I tried to put together a few approaches that you can use so if you have experience with um, political things, if you have industry relationships, you should maybe reach out to corporations and make them sign commitments. You could also try to lobby decision makers into bringing legislative change into action and try those things just more on like the political and industry side. On the other hand, or not on the other hand, really along the same way, if you're an activist and you're advocating for animals, you should make sure to include fish. And we just heard a talk from Leslie about this. And we should really, if you advocate for veganism, include fish in that advocation. Make sure that you're mentioning fish and that they get into people's minds and they're just a, as much a topic as chickens, for example, are. If you're a lawyer, you could start legal proceedings. So you could consider thinking about, well, is the way the fish are reared really reflected in the final product advertisement or is there some discrepancies and if there is then point them out and make clear that the companies are held accountable and finally if you're an investigator and you live especially in the americas asia or africa make sure to visit farms and tell people about what you saw and I guess with investigator, we really mean everyone, right? Anyone can be an investigator. If you have a farm in your city or close by in another city, you can visit it. And if you want help, you can reach out to us. And we actually have some information about how you can best go about this. And you can go there, have a little tour, take some pictures, and just share that information with people in the movement to get a better idea about what conditions are actually like on those farms. So finally, um, I want to take a step back and just recall what we talked about. Um, so I guess my first key takeaway would be that fish farms are extremely diverse and each of them holds their own challenges, but also opportunities. And we should keep that in mind. Second, um, there are more and more groups focusing on fish and working on fish. And we just don't really yet have a good idea of what works. So that's why third, now is the time for exploration, right? So we should exchange information, try things, and just help each other out in finding the best intervention that we can help fish with. And four, you should try to get creative about your messaging. What works in one country may not work in another country. And there, fortunately, are very different things that are affected by fish welfare, and we can use them to make the people we target care. And finally, um, you can find my email address down here. So you can contact us if you, for example, want to be connected with fish welfare specialists from around the world. We have built up a pretty good network and we're very happy to relay that information and those contact people um, to you. Also, um, you could um, reach out to us if you want to visit farms, like I said earlier. We also have some internships and volunteering opportunities. And also let us know if you're an organization working on a different animal right now and you want to work on fish, but something is hindering you from doing that, let us know and maybe, you know, we can help you moving into the direction you want to move into. So with that, um, that was the presentation. Thank you for listening and thank you for being part of a movement to expand our moral circles. Thank you, Jennifer. It was so interesting. Uh, we have uh, questions here, so I, I start. Uh, how do differences between fish species affect how the animals movement should in engage with fish welfare? Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And I think it really gets at an important point that um, 
fish, they're not just one species. Um, there is a bunch of different species that are being farmed. And we really need to tailor our interventions to those specific species to give some actionable steps. It would be very important to first define what those species need. Um, so we're, for example, writing up reports about our priority species in Asia, specifically India, and we're trying to really get at what does that specific species need, what are optimal parameters for them to live in. And based on that, we can then design our asks, for example, and with those asks, we can go to institutions, um, corporations, or the government and present them. But yeah, it's definitely worth or imp very important to keep in mind that in that sense, we have to move a little differently than for other animal movements, just because there's no such single thing as like the pig or like it's not the fish, it's like the fishes, right? And there's a bunch of different species. Yeah. Which of the production systems you have outlined in your presentation are the worst for welfare, which are most common? Interesting question. Yeah. Um, so I'm like a little hesitant to say what's worse for welfare because it's very hard to tell what the fish are actually experiencing when in those conditions. Um, but my guess really would be that, for example, sea cages where you put highly migratory species, the expression of natural behavior is going to be a very big issue. Um, while when you're keeping some fish in a pond at a very low stocking density, that's how they naturally occur, right? So they're probably, I could imagine there's less welfare issues right there just because that technically could be their natural habitat. Of course, in the end, they're going to be slaughtered, which is not the natural process. Um, but in that sense, sea cages or holding highly migratory species in those sea cages could be way worse for welfare than a pond farm with very low stocking density is. Um, yeah, and the second part was the most common system, I think. Yeah, which are, yeah. <laughs> okay. Which most is most common. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think for that, the answer is like there is not really one answer it really depends on the country um so like i said in asia we found a lot of the backyard pond farms whereas in norway you have a bunch of those sea cages and offshore farms um, because there's a lot of salmon production so you could tell you could say like the most common for a particular species um, but it's very hard to say what's the most common in the world really um, but definitely for example the recirculatory agriculture system since it's very cost intensive it's something that's not as common right now especially in um, more like developing or upcoming countries where you just don't have that income base like you would for example in Norway. Another one is uh, what do you think are the key welfare issues the animal movement needs to address? Okay, yeah, um, that's an interesting question. And I think it's, again, a hard one to answer because all the species are very different. Um, so we're trying to write up a report or we're, we're writing up a report right now um, about India. Again, we're trying to focus very much because it, there is such diversity um, about which, which interventions are possible and which ones could work there. Um, in terms of welfare. But yeah, to just maybe throw out a few things, um, there would be water quality. So you can, for example, install aerators, which are basically little paddles that put oxygen into the water and thereby increase the oxygen content, which is good for the fish um, when there's low oxygen. You could also act on um, more like another side where it would be environmental enrichment with basic, which basically means you could put some plants and just some hiding opportunities for the fish to resemble more of a natural environment to them. But again, it very much depends on the species. And I hate to give this answer because it seems like I'm trying to avoid the question, but it really does. Um, it depends on the species and the farming system very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have another one. 
Our question is which of the production system you have ah this is uh, also the same what is the optimal number of water quality measure measurements on farm you mentioned every second day was not an option hmm. yeah so yeah i might have generalized too much there i think it depends on your farming system too so for example if you're on an open ocean farm obviously um like you're very reliant on the natural conditions there and you can control them very little but if you have a pond farm for example that is inland water quality can change very quickly if for example it gets super hot during the day um, and there's a lot more plankton building up they respirate all that oxygen at night and your oxygen levels are just gonna like drop down super quick um, so ideally you want to take samples at least once a day um, for some people, that's just not possible. But there's also the difference between just taking a sample of the pH and taking an action like oxygen level sample. So you could take those easy measurements, maybe at least once or twice a day, and then maybe some more um, complex ones where you actually need a laboratory for. You could maybe take every second, third day. Um, but ideally, the more often, the better, just because you actually see the issues faster and you can act on them faster and actually save the fish from whatever consequences that has. Oh uh, yeah, another one. Oh uh, yeah, it's also the same. Which of the approaches you have outlined is Fish Welfare Initiative focusing on? Yes, yeah, so we're focusing, so right now we're um, in the process of hiring a country director in India. So we have decided on India and we have also decided on bringing about institutional welfare change. So we want to um, make work with farmers right now and make a proof of concept about an approach that actually works. And then after we have that proof of concept, go to corporations and the government and bring about institutional change to actually change the laws and legislation in a given country. Mm -hmm. okay, and how do you prepare yourself for farm visits? Where do you find species specific information? Okay, yeah. Um, so definitely reach out to Haven for farm visits because he has done most of our farm visits. He's also in the chat so you can find him under Haven King Nobles and you can also just email me and I can give you his email. But basically um, we have introductory materials that we can give you and also to find species specific information you should check out the fish etho base. I'll write it in the chat right now. Um, and there you can find most of the species and very specific information on them also concerning their specific needs in terms of having highest welfare. And yeah, that would be, I think, I would say a very good first source. And for anything else, you can always reach out to us. Um, and you mentioned a joint certification scheme that uh, could help unite organizations on this issue. Is this something you are working on already? Mm, yeah, so we're not working on a certification scheme specifically. Um, we have considered that actually in the early days of FWI, um, whether that should be something we should be pursuing, but we do think there is already certification out schemes out there that we can just work with. Um, there is a new alliance, it's called the Aquatic Animal Alliance, led by the Aquatic Life Institute, which is basically an alliance of all the major animal advocacy organizations and the people concerned about fish in those organizations. And we're trying to put together, we're consulting certification schemes about how they could improve welfare in their standards. And we're also putting together like a general ask for certification schemes. So that's something, um, yeah, that's like a united effort where we try to come together as a group and tell the certification schemes what they could improve in terms of welfare. Mm -hmm. Good to know. Um, another one is, do you think working on slaughter regulations is a good place to start as it is 
least complex considering the different needs of fish species? Mm, yeah, it's definitely, I, I think it's a good place to start. Um, we have done some models about whether we should be working on slaughter or something that's affecting the fish for a longer period. Um, because obviously slaughter, it's a very intense suffering. But if you just look at how long it affects them, it's very minimal compared to their whole life. Um, and that's why we personally decided to not work on slaughter right now. We might very well change our opinion. We're always open to changing that if we find something new. Um, but yeah, generally in some countries, it may be beneficial to work on slaughter. And there has been successful campaigns for example, Tesco in the UK, um, they get a lot of their fish from Vietnam, their Pangasius is from Vietnam and working on, um, so Tesco basically said they're not going to take um, fish from Vietnam that was not stunned, which basically means that the fish needs to be unconscious before their gills are slit open or anything. And they achieve that and that also goes down the supply chain. So now the suppliers in Vietnam need to electrically stun, uh, percussively stun those fishes and that in turn affects a lot of fish. Um, so working on slaughter can be good, um, but we should also keep in mind that it is not like the ultimate goal, right? Because it's only a few minutes or hours of their life compared to the whole life that they could um, live and suffer. Yeah. Uh, and another one is what are the welfare issues with free range or wild caught fish? Yeah, so um, so we're not working on wild caught fish, but we have given this some thought. Um, but yeah, just to mention that we're probably no experts on that. Um, but the biggest welfare issues here um, are at contact, right? Because you're usually affecting the fish when you start hunting them and catching them um, for wild fish. And that means that the hunting or capture methods um, can be really cruel. So you have, for example, long lines where the fish like latch onto that line, they bite into the hook, and then they could be left out there for days, um, maybe partially being eaten by another animal, maybe just starving, being under pain from having that hook in their mouth. Um, so methods like long line could, I, we could imagine, are really, really bad in terms of the fish well-being. Whereas other methods, like such as purse saners, are still not good, but maybe better in that sense that it's faster at least. Um, there is some ships out there that have stunning equipment on board. So they pump the fish out of the net, the person that they catch it with and then they're stunned in that tube, but that's still like a super prototype. Um, it's highly cost intensive, super expensive. Um, there's maybe one or two ships right now that have it and they run on a lot of funds just because people are interested in that intervention. But yeah, largely capture and slaughter is, are some of the major issues here for wild caught fish. Okay. Do you have any recommended reading to learn more about the experience of fish? Yeah, so there is um, Jonathan Balcom, who was also mentioned in the talk before, but his book indeed is very good. It's called What a Fish um, Knows. I'd rather write it in the chat right now. Um, and yeah, it's a really good book to learn more about fish and also to learn some facts that you would have just never thought about. Um, so for example, that like some fish species such as shark and tuna, they're just crazily unrelated and we're actually more closely related to tuna, for example. Um, so things like that are super interesting to read. And he also just shows how fish sometimes exceed our capabilities. For example, their sense of smell is far beyond what we could ever imagine. Um, so that's a really nice book to read if you just want to learn more about what extraordinary animals fish really are. Okay, um, what do you think are the most effective ways of raising awareness, shifting public opinions about fish's moral worth? Yeah, so I think it, and that's probably where 
I'm maybe differing from other people, but I do think that um, just thinking about maybe not ethics, but also other areas could be really helpful. Um, so if you, if you encounter someone and you're trying to make the moral argument like, well, fish have moral worth and they're just like beings like us and we shouldn't harm them. And you're just running into a wall, maybe consider getting creative about it. And maybe that at first goes against, you know, the general theme of like, well, we just should consider them as moral sentient beings. Um, but if people don't do that, then we should think about, well, do you care about the environment? Then you should maybe care about fish welfare, because actually if fish welfare is slow, it can really badly impact the environment. And likewise, if, for example, people don't care about the environment or the fish, but they care about um, public health and human safety, you could be like, well, you know what, if fish are stressed and they're slaughtered, there's actually a ton of bacteria building up in them. So if you bring that onto the market, you can really have like high, uh, sorry, like a lot of diseases in humans too. And things like that, maybe just diversifying the messaging around this could be really helpful for fish. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, what are the welfare issues uh, with free range or wild caught fish? I think we already have that one. Yeah, yeah. Unless someone else asks it again. Yes, yeah, sorry, maybe it's a uh, second time we heard. Uh, and another one uh, How can pers percussive stunning be implemented in large scale units? Yeah, so maybe I'll just explain real quick where percussive stunning is, because I don't know if everyone here knows it, but percussive, so you have two ways of rendering a fish unconscious, which is electrical and percussive stunning. Electrical stunning basically means um, you electrify them and that should render them unconscious. And percussive stunning usually means that you need to give them a blow on their head and that would render them unconscious. Um, so you could do that, for example, um, with like a stick and um, just hit them on the head. That's usually also what anglers do. Um, maybe you have seen that before. But yeah, how can it be implemented in large scale units? Usually what they do, um, or how I've seen it, is that the fish basically come down a bend and they literally do it by hand and render them unconscious like that. Um, I'd be like, I'm not sure about like super automated stunning equipment like that for percussive stunning, to be honest with you. But there is a problem with like actually rendering them unconscious if you don't do it by hand, right? Because you don't have a hold of like actually hitting the right part of the head to get them unconscious and also hitting them with the right amount of force um, because you just have smaller individuals, bigger individuals. And again, if you don't do stunning right, then that is seriously bad for the fish because you're literally slaughtering them alive. So as bad as like percussive stunning and all that sounds, it's actually a way of at least having the animal unconscious for the process of slaughter and at least minimizing that suffering. Yeah. Since a fish advocacy is fairly new, what are some of the re uh, reactions you have met, positive or negative? Interesting question, yeah. Um, so I think positive, um, I'm just surprised about how many people actually care about fish. Um, I always thought that, you know, we're very niche about caring about fish, but there's a lot of people out there. And I think um, we should definitely connect with those people. And there's a lot of organizations working on fish, a lot of people having great ideas about how we can help fish. And um, I think that's very encouraging to hear. And there is actually like, in academics, there is a field of fish welfare studies and they've been working on this for a very long time. There's highly knowledgeable people out there who really have a good idea of how we can best help those fish. I think now we're just at the point where we actually need to implement those ideas and we actually need to start um, implementing them large scale to affect a lot of individuals. Um, and negative, I think not so much for the movement. I couldn't think of something negative, just generally, um, obviously, the more you read into those issues, the more you realize how cruel the deaths of fish really are. Um, so you do have, for example, some countries where it's a habit to eat fish alive um, or to boil them alive and do things like that. So 
I think the more you read into the topic, you also got to be prepared for some very shocking um, videos and images. Yeah. So thank you for everything. We have some questions, but uh, we are on time for break. Um, guys, if you want to uh, want to discuss, uh, we can uh, make a breakout room for this coffee break, which will be now. Uh, Jennifer, thank you for your presentation and very interesting uh, informations. There are so many. This is so so big theme. So uh, everybody, hands up. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>